After a long layover, welcome to this video on five World of Darkness games that we could get, but probably never will, drawn from five games that aren't Vampire the Masquerade. While I was away, a video came out by the Swedish company that apparently had a, let's say, mixed reception. So it got me thinking, what if the Swedish company wasn't so hell-bent on leaving money on the table and leaving the rest of this massive setting languishing in its vault? So I sat down and cobbled together about five ideas for World of Darkness video games that I think would be fun, but will probably never be made. So without further ado, let's get going. Number 5. Middle Earth Shadows of Mordor meets Mummy the Resurrection. To kick off the party with a criminally underappreciated game line, Mummy the Resurrection, the unambiguous good guys of the World of Darkness, the true immortals, warriors, sorcerers, and scholars who fight the long war against the god of destruction, the great serpent of darkness, Apophis, and its various minions, most notably the followers of Set. Middle-earth Shadows of War and Shadows of Mordor are action RPGs, but what stands out and makes them interesting is their nemesis system, a procedurally generated storytelling mechanic that creates opponents and moves them along with the player character through their stories depending upon the outcome of their encounters. In the Shadows games, enemy encounters can end in more ways than just death, loot corpse, repeat. If the player kills an enemy, other characters may be generated who seek vengeance on the behalf of the slain. If the player dies, the enemy who killed them gains strength and remembers them when they next meet. If a player flees a battle, the enemy taunts them later for their cowardice. Other possible outcomes are that another enemy might rescue their ally, the enemy might escape of their own volition to fight another day, or even return from the dead themselves, more dangerous to the player character than before. Given that mummies have decades or even centuries of experience under their respective belts, they are justified in beginning the game with numerous skills and abilities. And having a wide variety of enemies to choose from, such as mortals, sorcerers, ghouls, vampires, shapeshifters, and bane mummies, to say nothing of the anthropophagi, or cannibals, the enemy encounters would always potentially remain fresh and varied. As for setting, I'm a suckery for scenery porn, so let's set the game in the late 19th century Egypt, around the time the British, French, and Germans were staking their claims to the area, so that we can also add supernaturals of European extractions to the mix, either as enemies or as allies. Number 4. Darkest Dungeon meets Dark Ages Inquisitor. Hunter the Reckoning. Hell, you probably already know what Hunter the Reckoning is if you're watching this video. If not, I have a video in the catalog you can listen to to get caught up. What I don't have is a video on Dark Ages Inquisitor, which is kind of a precursor to Hunter the Reckoning set during the Dark Medieval, in which the Holy Hunters of the Shadow Inquisition stalk the Predators of the Night and purify them with fire, steel, and divine wrath. Darkest Dungeons is a roguelike tactical RPG in which the player character, known as the Heir, seeks to restore their ancestral lands which are overrun by bandits, cultists, and monsters, some of earthly origin, some sorceress, and some not altogether of this world, all leading the Heir towards the horror that dwells within the Darkest Dungeon and the mind-shattering truth of the world itself. The Heir must hire, equip, manage, and lead a roster of adventurers each of whom has their own skills to contend with the enemies that the air must overcome and weaknesses for those same enemies to exploit. The adventurer must contend not only with injury, but with poison and disease, and also fear and madness as they come face to face with things that test and in some instances break the human mind. Now I enjoy games that show little to no mercy to players and Darkest Dungeon is just such a game. If you don't believe me, go ahead, log on to Steam, and look at the actual completion percentages for this game, somewhere between 3 to 5 percent. They don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. Mixing it in with Dark Ages Inquisitor just seems like a natural fit. Settings-wise, you'd be in 12th century Transylvania, in a nameless village smack dab in the middle of the Omen War between House Tremere and Clan Zemitzi. The Shadow Inquisition comes in to clean this den of evil as only medieval hunters can. The player character, as the Grand Inquisitor, is going to have to clear the roads so that supplies and fresh hunters can be brought into the village, 
to build it up as a base of operations, supply and train their inquisitorial forces, and plan expeditions against the Tremere and the Zemitsi. On the Tremere side, you'd have the Custos, their guardians, acolytes, lesser mages and sorcerers, gargoyles, homunculi, and of course, vampires. On the side of Clan Zemitsi, you have again mortals, but you also have revenants, Schlachta, Vazads, Kuldoons, or elemental sorcerers, and whatever other vampire made horrors behind human comprehension were just making the Zemitsi feel a little bit cute that night. And since we're in the village, we might as well throw some werewolves in the woods and some wraiths and zombies in the cemeteries just to keep things interesting. And just to maximize the sadism, to make sure that the players understand that they are here to suffer, to question every life decision that brought them to the point of buying this game, let's make the final boss an earthbound demon, one with at least one earthbound lore maxed out from Demon the Fallen, preferably the lore of contamination, so that the Inquisitors can come face to, well, face to whatever, with an unspeakable servitor, and all of the fun that is to be had with reality itself coming apart at the seams. Number 3. Dark Souls meets Wraith the Oblivion. Following up a punishing game with a merely challenging one, or rather two, Wraith the Oblivion and Dark Souls. Wraith and Dark Souls share many similar themes. Death, redemption, resilience, decay, sacrifice, humanity, monstrosity, and hope. Wraiths are plunged into a world largely shaped through the choices of those who have preceded them and must navigate through lands that are strange, terrifying, and alien against enemies who attack them without rhyme or reason and remain out of oblivion's grip by supreme will and attachment to the memories of life. Now in our game of Dark Wraith Souls, we're not even going to waste our time in the Shadowlands. We're going straight into the underworld, beyond the tempest, and wandering the far shores, those islands of expectation and memory inside the tempest that can either be paradises, hells, or anything in between, just so we can feature those decayed, dark, eerie, and otherworldly levels and environments that are essential to the Souls games, to say nothing of the freaky enemies our nameless protagonist will be fighting. So what is our nameless wraith doing? Well, they're riding around in the tempest on a boat, landing on various far shores to track down relics which, when combined, will allow the wraith to either be resurrected, transcend, or maybe even become something else, which they must pry from the hands of seven fallen shining ones who rule their various far shores as monstrous god kings of their own private paradises, which are really hells to everyone else. The backstories of these fallen ones will get told through item descriptions as is only appropriate for Dark Souls. And because this is Wraith, there has to be a shadow, a dark little section of the Wraith psyche wedded to a desire for oblivion that occasionally works against the psyche's interest. If the Wraith is defeated, the character is plunged into an alternate realm for a harrowing, a pocket realm where the Wraith's shadow gets to torment them until the Wraith figures out how to escape, usually by solving some sort of puzzle or riddle connected to their past, before the harrowing wrecks the Wraith and sends them back with some sort of permanent stat damage. As for endings, we have to have multiples of course. If the Wraith has been good and they get the relics, they resolve their attachments and can pass on to their next life. If they've been bad, they become shadow eaten and use the relics to transform into a Malfian or rather a dark spectral god of the underworld. Another possible ending would be to gain the relics but refuse to use them, and choose to remain in the underworld as one of the ferrymen, rescuing lost souls from the perils of the Tempest. But one thing is non-negotiable in this prospective game. We shall parry, and we shall parry our way to victory. And for those who can't parry, well, I guess you just have to get good. Number 2 Persona meets Changeling the Dreaming. Now if any game line in the world of darkness could pull off the union of dungeon crawler and social sim, Changeling the Dreaming is it. The Changeling video is up on the corner somewhere. Go watch it, enjoy it, absorb it. The Persona series is a spin-off of the much beloved Shin Megami Tensei series, which focuses on the daily life travails of high school students, combined with those same students discovering that they have supernatural powers in an alternate reality parallel to our own, which they must use to unravel mysteries touching on both worlds and eventually confront or defeat 
a God who seeks to destroy or enslave humanity. I know that I'm not doing the series as proper justice, but I'm just trying to keep things brief. But let's just say Persona is a very Gnostic fairy tale. Adolescence plays a major role in changeling the dreaming because that's when many changelings awaken to their true natures while retaining the belief that the world is open to what they want. How would we go about synthesizing changeling and persona? Let me lay it out. In keeping with persona, let's say we have a city kid who gets in trouble at home and shipped off to a rural high school for one year. As they begin to get acclimated to their new surroundings, they become aware of their true nature as a fae and of the existence of the dreaming as they come under attack from nightmare chimera which are attacking students to feed on their dreams and souls. Our transfer student changeling encounters other students who also turn out to be changelings of different kids and together they form parties to explore the dreaming, fight the nightmare chimera and build their freehold, an abandoned building in reality but a manor house inside the dreaming. The story progresses and the changeling party discover that the nightmare chimera are under the control of another party of changelings composed of some students and some adults who are members of the Shadow Court, seeking to bring about winter, a time in which many changelings will die and glamour, the magic which sustains them, will vanish from the world, but eventually return and give way to a new spring and the rebirth of the Fae. The transfer student can choose to fight the Shadow Court and destroy them, thus becoming Lord or Lady of the Freehold, and remain in the town to protect it against the encroachment of winter. They could choose to reject the fight against the Shadow Court, abandon the town and their party to a fight that they will likely eventually lose. They can choose to join the Shadow Court and either recruit or destroy their former allies' face souls with cold iron, or they can go for that true ending, defeat the Shadow Court, and confront the Nightmare Fomorian within the Deep Dreaming, and after a legendary battle, emerge victorious, thus freeing the town from further attacks by the Elder Darks, the Agents of Winter, and the Nightmare Chimera. Number 1. XCOM meets Werewolf the Apocalypse. Okay, now it's time for the one I've really been waiting for. XCOM, specifically Enemy Within, was probably one of my all-time Xbox 360 favorites. It is a tactical third-party shooter with base management, as you control a multinational military operation to protect the Earth from alien invaders by killing them and reverse engineering their technology for use by your team. As you start the game, your team is a bunch of guys and gals with guns and little else. By end game, you have killer robots, cyborgs who treat load-bearing walls as a minor obstacle to the pulping of alien guts via extreme mechanical fisting, mutants who can parkour two-story buildings and see across entire battlefields, and psionic troopers who can turn alien minds into lightly scrambled eggs and tank a sectopod's main cannon with the power of telekinetic shielding. You command your team across varying terrains, exploit elevation, cover, line of sight, and fog of war to keep as much of your team alive as possible while eradicating extraterrestrial scum with extreme prejudice. Or you can capture them so that your attractive astrobiologist Fraulein can ethically question them and afterwards, chop up the remains for parts we use in our own weapons program. Dr. Volin, what could I say? She's probably some progenitor's Oshi. Tactics and warfare against overwhelming odds is probably the greatest fit for Werewolf the Apocalypse, and I will without delay tell you how I would set it up. The war in the Amazon, the big battle between the Garu under the legendary Get of Fenris warlord, Gogol Fangs first, against Pentex, and by extension the worm's nastiest, dirtiest, filthiest, pollutingest baddies. Lots of Garu and kinfolk headed down to South America to join the war effort, so you would have a broad sweep of different Garu and different tribes with their own suites of skills and gifts to bring with them. So you can build that big multi-tribal pack or sept for Gaia's justice, utilize pack tactics to fight numerically superior enemies, or wormish powerhouses from the darkest depths of the Umbra, for whom the word Garu is a synonym for light snack. The Amazon covers a large area which could lead to the creation of a variety of maps of different terrain, from rainforests to river basins to logging camps to villages and so on. The game would also have multiple mission types, including eradication, reconnaissance, sabotage, and securing or extracting high-value targets. 
To circle back to the enemies, we have all sorts of nasty options at our fingertips. Starting out with low level mercenaries and guns for hire to start with, we then move on to the bigger and badder, such as the Fomori, then Pentex first team specially trained to kill Garu, then Black Spiral dancers, and materialized worm spirits. I would like a mechanic that utilizes the Umbra, specifically one that allows the Garu to step sideways past the gauntlet so that they could ambush or even be ambushed from the spirit world. But that's just an idea. Maybe create a mixed kinfolk Garu team where the kinfolk can push or lead enemies into choke points and kill zones for their Garu compatriots to step in from out of nowhere to rip and tear until it is done. And because Paradox has a raging hard-on for DLC, I want to offer up an option for an actual DLC that's worth doing and not just selling a game piecemeal to the customers. So if War in the Amazon is the base game, then Russia, during the reign of the Iron Hag, Baba Yaga, would be the DLC. Same core game idea, only set during the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union and the characters would be a mixture of Silver Fangs, Bone Nars, Glass Walkers, Geta Fenris, Red Talons, Children of Gaia, and I don't know, whoever else I left out. Fighting against the armies of Baba Yaga which included Vampires, Sorcerers, Fomori, Spirits, and of course the P.A. de Resistance, one of the Seven Great Zmei, the Dragon, Gregornis Deathwing. And those are my five ideas for World of Darkness video games that will likely never be made. I am but a mere consumer of video games and not a maker of them. I am decently well versed however in World of Darkness lore and even played a few games that aren't vampire. So I know there's a lot of material to pull from, expand on, play with, explore that might appeal to people who aren't vampire fans or even to vampire fans who are open to good stories about other game lines. Which brings me around to Bloodlines 2. I'm not going to toll the corpse bell on this game. I will say that I don't have a lot of confidence that the game will be any good, mechanically or narratively, the latter being the graver offense because Vampire is all about memorable characters and stories. One of the biggest lessons to take away from the first Bloodlines is that the better and deeper your story is, the more forgiving your audience is of shortcomings in either graphics or mechanics. And unfortunately, a Bruja who practices Hokuto Shinkin, or a vampire whose name came off of MomJunction.com are not enough at this point to get me to lay down any dollars for this game. But a Werewolf XCOM game? Yes. Pretty please. Take my $70 and hook that shit straight into my veins. Anyway, that's all I have for the video game talk. As always, thank you for listening, and until next time. Ah!